This is a particular psalm written by um, David, who is in the midst of a really awkward situation. What's awkward about it is that his son is trying to take the throne from him. And it's a time of national calamity in Israel because everybody is kind of wondering what in the world is going on. David is supposed to be the king. His son is trying to take the power. And then he has personal problems happening in his life at the same time. You know, it's one thing when you have the world giving you problems. But it's another thing when you have your own personal problems to add to that. David's got job issues. That's another issue to have. No, I got national calamity happening. I have family issues happening. And I also have a job issue happening. You know you're in a bad season when you can't get a break at home. You can't get a break at work. And you can't turn the news on and get a break from your country. Somebody say amen. And, and David is writing this particular psalm with this attitude that I'm mad because I feel like home is trouble, work is trouble, nationally there's trouble. And David begins to write in Psalm 28 verse 1, Don't turn a deaf ear when I call you, God. If all I get from you is deafening silence, I'd be better off in the black hole. I'm letting you know what I need, calling out for help and lifting my arms towards your inner sanctum. Don't shove me into the same jail cell with those crooks, with those who are full-time employees of evil. They talk a good line of peace, then they moonlight for the devil. Pay them back for what they've done, for how bad they have been. Pay them back for their long hours in the devil's workshop then cap it off with a huge bonus because they have no idea how God works or what he's up to God will smash them the smithereens and walk from their ruins that's in y'all scripture blessed be God he heard me praying he proved he's on my side I've thrown my lot in with him now I'm jumping for joy shouting and singing my thanks to him God is all strength for his people, ample refuge for his chosen leader. Save your people, bless your heritage, care for them, carry them like a good shepherd. I would like to title this simple sermonic expression before I go back to my vacation time called Carry Me. Bump your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the last time. Well, second to last time, I'm going to talk to you. The message title is, you're not talking to me. The message title is, carry me. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, this is the second to last time. I'm going to talk to you or look at you. The message title is, carry me. Psalm 28 is David's word to the Lord saying, Lord, don't you dare turn a deaf ear to me because if you turn a deaf ear to me, I'd be better off in a black hole. There's nothing worse than communicating and someone not listening. There's nothing more arduous than you talking and someone not hearing what you're saying. There's nothing worse in life than to pour out your heart and feel like the person you poured it to did not receive it. And David is saying, Lord, if you're not going to speak to me, you might as well just leave me in a black hole because I cannot do nothing if you are not talking to me. Can I get a witness in the church? That if God doesn't say anything to you, you are in trouble. You don't know what decisions to make. You don't know where to turn. You don't know where to go. And he says, I'd be better off in a black hole. I'm letting you know what I need. That's a good place to pause and help you identify how to pray to God. 
you got to tell God what you need. God already knows what you need before you ask of it. But he still wants you to acknowledge what you need. Some of you talk to God like you're talking to God as if he's about to post your information on social media. God wants to know what you need. God, I need more money. I need a job. I need a house. I need a spouse. I need somebody to keep me company. I need better health. I need a better plan for my life. If you don't tell God what you need, God is waiting on you to be naked enough to be honest with him, to tell him what he already knows. It's like my kids yesterday, they were playing around and they videotaped themselves in the office, jumping off the chair, almost breaking the chair. And I go in there and I say to them, okay, now I brought my belt down and I want you just to tell me what you did. If you tell me what you did, you will not get... Oh, any DCF workers in here? Okay, wait a minute. I told them that I'm going to send you to time out if you don't behave, little boy. And, and, I, and I took my belt and said, in, in, the, in the inner city, we would normally whoop you. But I'm not going to do it to you, little DJ. I'm going to make you sit on your knees and read a story. So anyway, um, as we were going through this, I said, tell me what you did. Because I already know what you did. It's already recorded. But if you can be naked enough and honest with me, I will let you go from your transgression not because you're not guilty but because you are honest enough to tell me where you were and I asked my baby girl destiny what did you do and she shook her head and I said girl I will whoop you with this belt if you don't open your mouth and say something I mean I was telling you you will go to time out for long periods of time if you don't say and she said well we were playing uh, on the chair and we were doing is that the right thing to do no DJ what were you doing? Well, Destiny pushed me. No, 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 no. Tell me what you did. Don't blame it on anybody else because if you're honest with me, I can release you from something that I can protect you from. And some of you have been praying to God already. He knows what you need. He knows you're lonely. He knows it's cold outside. He knows you want to be kept. He knows you need more money. He knows you don't like the neighborhood that you're in, but you're scared to be honest with him and deliverance will come when you can recognize I need to be honest with you so I'll tell you what I need and my young precious Desi, Desi who cannot do no harm I said Desi what did you do she said I don't know daddy I said okay baby give me a hug you three you don't know what you're doing anyway it's okay so, so it says he says don't turn a deaf ear to me because if I'm talking to you I got to know you hear me. And God, even if you tell me no, just let me know it's a no so I don't feel like I'm by myself. Just, just I don't, you don't have to say yes, but if it's a no, just kindly let me know that you heard me because you letting me know that you heard me is sometimes more important than the answer that I receive. So he says, now let me know you heard me. And he says, God, I'm calling out for help. And I'm lifting my arms towards your inner sanctuary. The lifting of the hands was a symbol that, God, I can't do nothing without you. It, it wasn't just a sign of surrender like we use in our New Testament church when they say, lift your hands and worship. It was a sign to say, I, I just want you to know, God, that I can't do nothing without you. My hands are extended towards you because without you, there's no me. Without you, I can do absolutely nothing. So, God, I'm extending my hands towards you because, God, this world is going out of control and I can't fix it. I feel lost in it. I feel powerless in it but God I'm extending my hands and maybe you may be at the job and your boss is getting on your nerves and you don't have an opportunity to go in the bathroom because you use up all your 10 minutes of break time but you could just lift your hands and say Lord this is my sign of prayer it's my sign of extension to you it's my sign to let you know I need you in a way that cannot be articulated with words because sometimes whether you know it or not you may not know what to say 
away because your heart is so full but your tears are just saying this says it all God I can't express with my words what I want to say but the waving of my hands says it all God I may not be able to say what I need to say but the rocking back and forth says Lord understand the body language that I'm communicating to you and David says my son wants my throne my nation is in trouble my job is at risk my calamity is upon me some believe he was having health concerns at this moment the whole world is upon his shoulders everything that could go wrong is going wrong everything that he hoped could go right was going backwards and he's saying to himself Lord I don't want to go on Facebook live I don't want to tell the world my problems I don't want their likes but without their real affections I want to go to somebody who's going to hear me care about what I'm saying not just give me a bunch of hearts but really listen with true inspection and intention and he says Lord if I can't go to you then I might as well go to hell if I can't talk to you I might as well go in the grave because if you won't help me nobody else will and he says I've got to go and then he says don't shove me in the jail cell with the crooks for those who are full-time employees of evil they talk a good line of peace they moonlight with the devil pay them back for what they've done for how bad they've been pay them back for their long hours in the devil's workshop and cap it off with a huge bonus I, I want to pause and kind of help you work through this psalm and this expression David had some issues and he was angry and he was upset and he was disappointed and he was dejected and he felt as if God there are people who are profiting off of the pain of your people and he's trying to help God understand what God already knows that there are wicked evil doers that will stand in your face but plot to kill you behind your back there are people who say they love you but are working daily to tear you down. There are people who say they care about you. And really, if you could see their inboxes, they really don't care about you at all. There are people who say they are with you, but in circles, they say they are against you. There are people that say, I will stand with you and will walk away from you in the midst of calamity. And David says, pay them all back for the evil that they've done. And I know that's hard for you to reconcile, but David is being honest. Honest. he's saying Lord I'm tired of the evil always prospering I'm tired of the evil always getting away I'm tired of the evil sitting in boardrooms and sitting in back rooms making deals at the expense of the least of these I'm tired and I want you to repay them for their evil the church is afraid to be angry because we think being angry means you're sitting it doesn't mean to be angry means to be in sin. It says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Be angry but yet not sin. Be angry and yet not sin. You know some of you are scared to say you're angry because you've been coached. You've been provoked to say oh bless the Lord oh my soul. No baby you're angry about it. It's okay to be angry. There are times in your life if you're human you're going to get angry. You're going to be angry with your job. You're going to be angry with your kids. You're going to be angry with your spouse. You're going to be angry with your church. You're going to be angry with just everybody. It is what we call life. It's okay to be angry. Just don't sin in your anger. It's okay to be angry. Don't deny that you're angry because it doesn't help you. Don't act like you're not angry because it doesn't benefit you. Say you're angry. Be angry. Feel angry, but don't act angry. Say you're angry. Feel angry, but don't respond in your anger. You've got the right to be angry. I don't I don't know where this passive Christianity came from where you're afraid to express the sentiments of what you feel I know I'm not supposed to dislike my enemies but in this season I dislike them and I'm praying that the Lord will touch my heart I know I'm not supposed to talk about my haters but in this season I want to talk about them and nobody should make you feel bad about throwing yourself a pity party sometimes we all need to be a little bit angry 
but we cannot stay in our anger but you cannot dismiss your anger because if you do it will come back to you another way how do you feel oh God is in control I know he's in control dummy but I'm angry about it and I just want you to share in my anger I'm upset about it my child died I'm mad about it my heart is hurting I'm mad about it I don't always have to put on the Christian expression how you feel I'm pissed I'm single why it's okay to be angry sometimes Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Baby, I'm tired of faking it. I ain't got no gas in my car, and I'm angry about it. I'm so upset. Gas went up 20 cents. I was barely doing 195, and now it's back up to 225. I'm angry about it. It is okay to be angry. The scriptures give you permission, but it says, and you're angry, do not sin. And you need to learn how to say, Lord, I am upset. Lord, I am angry. Lord, I need your intervention. Some of you ain't angry enough. That's why change can't come in your life. You, you gotta get angry sometimes. You gotta get angry at life and how unfair it treats you. It's not God that treats you unfairly, it's life. When you come into the womb, everybody is guaranteed a fair chance at life it's where you go for the job and you're the most qualified and the home girl or the homeboy gets it because he knows the boss it's like you get fired and you did everything you're supposed to do and they let you go and promoted someone that was always late it is life life happens to us all life is not irrespective of your color your creed social economic status it just happens not everything that happens is God some stuff is just life when you live in life it's going to happen you're just going to have things that happen to you that you don't appreciate and you don't enjoy it's called life and we all could cry about it and all say our lives are unfair but everybody will have a dose of life I don't care if you're rich I don't care who you know I don't care how many people you know it's called life when Kevin Durant went to the Golden State Warriors it's called life things like that just happen things like that just happen and you've got to know that it is just life. You wake up one morning and you're sick in your body. It's life. It's not God always putting a sickness on you. It's called life. You wake up and go outside and you slip and fall and you break your leg. It's called life. Sometimes life just happens. And you need a moment to just say, God. I just can't believe that this is my life. Pump your neighbor and say, it's okay to be mad. Pump your other neighbor and say, it's okay to be mad. Pump your other neighbor and say, I know you know it's okay to be mad because you look mad right now. You look really mad. Man, did I do something to you? So, so it's, it's important. So now David goes down in the psalm, but then something switches in his soul. He doesn't just stay on his anger and doesn't just stay on the evil. He switches and says, but I'm going to put my lots in God. I'm going to put my confidence in God. I'm going to put my trust in God. I, I can't trust the news because it's always bad news. I, I can't trust some people on the social networks because they give bad news. Some give good news. But I'm going to put, if I've got to bet on anything, I'm going to bet on God. If I, if I got to put my money, and I'm not a gambler, if I got to put my money into a jackpot, I'm going to put my money in the Lord's jackpot because I'm going to believe that he's going to make something happen out of my darkness. And David says that even in darkness, God can still work light. 
And most of us want God's light, but we don't want God's darkness. Because in order to see light, there's got to be darkness. And the greatest levels of light that oftentimes happen in your life is when you're at the greatest level of darkness. I will not appreciate the light unless I have darkness. And when darkness comes upon me, light is soon to come. Most of us want light, but we don't want no darkness. But when I see darkness, I'm always excited because this means that God is about to showcase his light. And all darkness can't last always. And and you and I have the power to flip the switch to say, Lord, it may be dark today, but one thing, oh, sooky, sooky now. I just heard something. Do you know at midnight it's a new day, but it's still dark outside and you might be looking at the darkness and be tripping about the darkness and not recognize that there's a new day on the horizon. Don't let your darkness make you think that God is not with you because every level of darkness is maybe an indication that you're about to walk into a new day and though midnight looks dark it's really the start of something better and so darkness is not always a negative it could be a positive thing to tell you that though it's dark outside it is a good thing please hold this and don't don't take it to the poncho. So it may be dark outside, but please do not get it twisted that when it is dark outside, it does not always mean that God is absent. It does not always mean that God is not present. You are putting your confidence in the darkness. David says, I'm going to put my confidence in the light that beyond all this darkness, there has to be some light somewhere. Behind all this negativity, there has to be some light somewhere that God in his providential wisdom can take everything that's been negative and turn it around and make it work together for good that God can take negativity take a millennial generation that would sit around and just search for Pokemon and make them have a cause that seems bigger than themselves and get them outside of their house and unify and do something different God can take indifference and have greater good come from it but you do know whenever there's darkness there's a cry for the desperation of light and sometimes God allows doesn't do but allows the darkness to get the people to understand where their light was coming from in the beginning okay um, he says I had a dream I'm not talking about Martin Luther King's speech either. Um, I had a dream that, I don't know if I was in Orlando or where I was, but I seen an entire country mourning. And in this dream, you just seen people just weeping. And I went to a man and I said, what is going on? And the man said, the Lord has seen sorrow in the land. And I, and I was talking to the guy. I said, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? And I woke up from that dream and began to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. And there are some things that you can pray about that aren't going to change. But the Lord reveals it to you to let you know that even in the midst of calamity, I want you to know, Psalm 28, number one, that I'm going to infuse you with strength. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever been to the gym and... Um, uh, Joel will know he takes supplements so <laughs> uh, you've been to the gym and you take this supplement that helps you get more energy when you're running out of your natural energy and so what this energy does is it begins to work in your body when your body starts losing its own energy and that's what the word is talking about that I will begin to infuse you with strength when you start getting weak all of a sudden you'll get a second wind that kicks in and you won't know where it came from but it is the Lord infusing you with strength and it is amazing when you get infused with this strength because everybody else is tired everybody else is out of breath and you're like yeah player add another weight on there they're like whoa where'd you come from it is the strength of the Lord that is going to be working on your side when everybody is tripping and losing their mind you'll be infused with strength it doesn't mean that negativity won't happen it doesn't mean that calamity won't happen but it means that the Lord will infuse you with strength number two 
He says, no, nah, I'm not just going to infuse you with strength. I'm going to save you. Now, here's the very crucible of this thought. Just because he says he's going to save you doesn't mean he's going to rescue you from tribulation or catastrophe. First, you and I have to change our perspective. If you're saved and you die, you were blessed by the gift God just gave you. I know you weren't going to say amen. It's okay. The older saints who are much older, when you go talk, to, go talk to an older saint in the faith and you say to them, Mama, how you doing? I'm just counting my time. Why is she counting her time? Because she understands that where I'm about to go far exceeds where I am. See, y'all don't believe that because you believe this is the best life now. You think that this is heaven on earth. This is, does not compare. Can you imagine waking up tomorrow morning not having to worry about clocking in? That breakfast is already made for you. That is not hot. It's not humid. It's perfect temperature. The glory of God is everywhere. You go to your room. The door turn the door. It's made out of gold. The streets are made out of gold. There's no weeping. There's no sorrow. There's no discrimination. There's no turning on the news. And there's hatred. There's no bigotry. You're living a life when the presence of a heavenly father there's no discrimination there's no socioeconomic classes there's no whether i'm single whether i'm married what are my children going to do when they're going to come home there's none of that you're in a place of peace but most of us think we're here to stay when scripture tells us we are pilgrims passing through so it says i know it's hard for you to reconcile because you want to live your life you want to accomplish your dreams but if you know anybody who's in heaven, they would send you a text and say, I'm crying for you. Because where I am, there's peace forevermore. The passing of all understanding of peace. That's why we rejoice when those who are in the fold go to God. Because they are in the presence of God. We weep with those who we do not know where they go because not only did you live in hell now you're going to spend eternity in the literal hell but he says he'll save us saving us is the idea that it's happening around me but it's not happening in me so you're watching the news you're seeing negativity and you feel the negativity you feel the pain but it doesn't cause you to be in fear. Because fear is the trap of the enemy to keep you in bondage for the rest of your life. But God says, I'm going to save you because I do not want you to be in fear. You don't have to be afraid. God knows you're his children and he's already made provision for you. He's already secured your eternal destiny, but he's made provision for you. You do not have to be afraid. You do not have to live in fear. You do not have to walk outside and wonder about your tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Worry about your today. Today is the day the Lord has made. You're not supposed to be concerned about your tomorrow in that regard because tomorrow has enough challenges of its own. God gave you the gift of today and the devil is stealing it from you by giving Giving you the gift of fear well you got to tell the devil I don't want it anymore I'm not going to take it anymore I'm not going to keep it anymore I will believe what God has told me he will save me not only will he save me not only will he infuse me with strength the text says that he will bless me now I don't want you to get it twisted that the blessing that he's talking about is being on MTV Cribs but the blessing that he's talking about is nothing missing nothing broken total completeness 
Nothing missing, nothing broken, total completeness. Nothing missing, nothing. That's not about money because there are people who make less than you that are more blessed than you because there's nothing missing, nothing broken. They're not counting their burdens. They're counting their blessings. They're not counting their hiccups. They're counting what God has done for them. And God says, I will bless my children. You need to know that you are already blessed. Just because you don't recognize you're blessed doesn't mean you're not blessed. You are already blessed. To wake up this morning in your right mind, you're already blessed to be able to go to work and go home you're already blessed may not be the house you want but at least you got somewhere to lay your head this is the part that I need you to touch your neighbor and look at him and say neighbor my job for 60 seconds is to be a temporary prophet now grab your neighbor I give you permission to grab them and say neighbor you are not allowed to live in fear Shake that neighbor real good. Shake them like you're not scared of them. And say, neighbor, you are not allowed to live in fear. Shake another neighbor and say, neighbor, I command you that you will live this life with confidence, with faith. I command you not to be afraid, not to be intimidated. I command you shake that neighbor and say neighbor I command you to walk out in boldness I command you not to be afraid you are blessed you are highly favored you are blessed you are highly favored look at your neighbor and say you ain't talking to me I said hold on pause now I have a college degree and I'm about to infuse a little bit of Ebonics ghetto culture upon you. I want you to take your attitude like you from the hood of hoods and say neighbor with some authority with the rolling of your neck and say neighbor you are blessed. You are highly favored. You are blessed. You are highly favored. You are blessed. And highly favored say it to their believer you are blessed and highly favored I ain't got no job you are blessed and highly favored I'm tired but you in your right mind you are blessed and highly favored I'm sick in my body but you're still blessed and highly favored Now, Joel, let me borrow you because they don't know how to rock them and shake them right. I didn't say my watch. I said I, I'm going to borrow you. Come on stage. He's single too. So, this is how you rock them and shake them. Okay? Because they need to feel it. When life starts letting them know that they're not going to make it, you need to let them know, you are blessed, baby. Don't let it, don't get it twisted. Don't get it tripping. You know, they've never felt anybody rock them and shake them. And look at them and say, listen, my pastor gave me permission to rock you and shake you. I know it's uncomfortable, but I got to let you know, you are blessed and you are highly favored. It's not about what you drive. It's not about where you live. It's about the fact that God thought enough of you to wake you up this morning. You are blessed and highly favored. Let nobody steal that from you. Let nobody take that from you. You are you're blessed if you're gonna put any trust in anything you better put your trust in the Lord because I've never seen the righteous forsaken neither their seed begging for bread though we're persecuted on every side we're not cast down though we're in despair we're not destroyed peril on every side but the Lord 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 will bring you out got to have this confidence that even when it's negative God is still strong enough to bring about a positive he's able to do it he's more than able to make it happen 
He's more than capable of doing a big thing. He's more than capable of doing a great thing. He's more than able to make you a candidate for it. He's more than capable to bless you in the midst of calamity. He's more than able to take care of you in the midst of circumstances. He's more than able to look out for you when you feel like you're abandoned. He's more than able to take care of you when you feel like you're alone. He's more than able to keep you in your right mind when everything is falling around you. Yes. Yes. He will save you. He will preserve you. He will keep you. This confidence you cannot let anybody shake from you. He will preserve me. He will keep me. He will hold me. And the text says that Lord carry us like a shepherd which how many of you have sheep at your house that you raise okay nobody so let me answer your question when sheep would do their own thing oh, that's my friend pastor charles hey okay so when 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 sheep would when sheep would be walking and the shepherd would just be concerned about his sheep. He would go to the sheep, break their legs. And that sounds crazy, but he would break their legs to carry them. And sometimes God has to hurt you, but his hurting you is to preserve you. Like talking to me, his hurting you is to preserve you. It's hurting you. It's to preserve you. It's not to break you forever, but it's to hold you forever. And when you can't, and when you don't know how you're going to go, the Lord will carry you. The Lord will carry you. You don't need to have all the strength, but he will carry you. He will carry you. I'm a living witness. He will carry you. He'll carry you above the criticism. He'll carry you above the hatred. He'll carry you into the right space. He will carry you. You got to believe. You can't let people strip you of this confidence. My wife and I, we're watching watching CNN, which I always watch the news late at night. And um, they were showing this um, catastrophe in Paris and my wife was shaking about it. And my heart went out for the people. But my confidence was not shaken because the world wants to steal your confidence. You won't steal confidence your children need your confidence your family needs your confidence your mama and daddy who are aging if they're alive they need your confidence you can't afford to live afraid you can't afford to be in fear because God will repay the evil ones he will take care of the wicked Psalm 37 says fret not the evildoers for in due season they shall be cut off but blessed will you be delight yourself in the law of the Lord and meditate therein on it because the wicked will pay their sentence but you and I must have confidence look yourself in the mirror get your swag back in the words a bird man put some respect on God's name he ain't gonna leave you he ain't gonna forsake you he not gonna bet what type of dad do you think he is you ain't have to put him on child support he's always come through 
He's always taking care of you right on time. Be comforted. Be assured. The Lord has your life in the palm of his hands. The Lord has my life in the palm of his hands. No matter what they do, my life is in your hands. My soul is in your hands. My eyes will not close until the Lord tells me I'm finish my life my soul is in God's hands your life when you drive is in God's hands when you go to the doctor the doctor has a say but your life is in God's hands I've seen God do miracles when doctors said it couldn't be done your life is in God's hands I've seen finances debt be erased because your life is in it's in God's hands fear is a taught emotion my children were on a plane with me and they were flying and the plane took a drop and I looked at my son and he wanted to see was I in fear and when I smiled and laughed at him he started thinking every drop was funny because fear is a learned emotion my father wanted me to ask you a question where in the world did you learn that emotion because he never gave it to you he never instilled it in you he never instilled fear upon you fear is an emotion that is learned and God never gave you the spirit of fear it was rocky the plane was going up and down and the craziest thing happened I decided to look at the flight attendant and the flight attendants were just sitting there chilling drinking their drinks sipping their tea and I made up in my mind if they're not going to lose their mind then I'm safe well the last time I looked when CNN Fox was playing their negative report I looked up to the heavens and I didn't see my father reorganizing the stars I didn't see my father rearranging the sun I didn't see my father reorganizing the moon that means that everything everything every, every, everything is in his hand Confidence. Confidence. Find confidence even in your frailty. Even in the midst of I didn't say that God. Let me tell you this. And I'm closing for real. I'm going on vacation tomorrow, so I'm preaching as much as I can. I used to have this fear. Y'all, most of you know my, my testimony. My sister, she's, she lives out in the streets and does whatever and believing that God would bring her back. And I used to have this fear of seeing her in that condition. One day I was driving downtown two weeks ago and fear is different from person to person. You may not be afraid to live life, but you may be a fear of other things. So I knew where she hung out and I went down the street and I go up to her and I knew she was there with her backpack and I drive up to her and I roll down my window and I look at her and I see her condition, which is not good. But I allowed fear not to steal me the opportunity to let her know that I still love you that I still care for you. But fear will make you drive right past them knowing that they're there 
because you don't want to see them in the condition that they're in. Fear is different from person to person, but you got to learn how to overcome your fear. Face what is facing you and look it in the face and tell it, I will not be intimidated by you. I will not be ashamed of you. I will not you allow you to put me in a mental prison because of fear but I will drive down downtown and face my fear and look my fear in the face and say, I have this courage, I have this confidence that this hope that I have, the world didn't give it to me and I can't let circumstances or life strip it from me. Face your fears because you'll find great faith in your frailty. By your hands, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, your word. It's life, it's truth. It helps console, it helps us get over calamity, it helps us get over challenges. So Lord, I thank you that we don't live in fear, but we live in faith. That our hope is not built on anything the foundation of Jesus that he laid for us 2,000 years ago. I thank you for uncommon faith that cast out all fear. It's in Jesus' name.